If you refer to your you'll see that uh, this talk was originally supposed to be by Professor Robert Knopp, uh, how, the, uh, how open source helped to discover the accelerating universe. Unfortunately, he's had a uh, personal issue that came up which uh, made him unavailable for the convention. And uh, instead, we have uh, Jason Scott, who has uh, volunteered to step in and uh, give us a substitute presentation. Uh, his topic is going to be the Wheel of Computer History. Uh, for those who aren't familiar with Jason Scott, um, he uh, is the one who produced the BBS documentary. And what other documentaries have you done? Have you, haven't you done some others? Uh, I produced the BBS documentary, and I'm working on two more. Oh, there you go. Okay. And I'm working on two more. What? When are they out, or what are they about? Both. Okay, well, when you're working on a documentary and what you think it's going to come out is a whole different theory. When I, wor when I worked on the BBS documentary, I thought it was going to be a year of filming, a year of editing, and then riches. And it turned out that it was three and a half years of filming, a half year of editing, and riches. Um, so for these two new ones I'm working on, one is called Git Lamp, and it's a story about text adventures, interactive fiction, infocom, and everything else associated with them. Um, the other one is called Arcade. It's about arcades. And I believe the current plan is for GitLamp to be done by the end of next year and for Arcade to be done by 2009. So we'll see. You have to plan ahead. Um, arcade is going to dwarf BBS documentary because I want to do it right. Doing it right is not always doing it quickly. Okay, before we hand it off to you completely, sure. Um, after this presentation, we have scheduled a dinner break for two hours. So uh, at the end of Jason's presentation, uh, go ahead, take your dinner break, and at 8 o'clock, back in here for the next presentation of the evening. All right, uh, Jason, I hand it over to you. Thanks. Sure. Okay, this is still your time to get out if you were here for the other guy and you want to be polite about it. It's okay. <laughs> Perfectly understood. Um, I don't use PowerPoint. I don't do presentations. I don't read from text when I talk. Um, I'm somewhat improvisational, which can sometimes lead to great insight and sometimes lead to rambling. But one of the side effects of that is that whereas people have been trained to think that there's a screen next to them that tells them what to do, I've replaced that with the current world record in Mario 64. Um, this guy uh, played Mario 64 all the way through, 120 stars in two hours. Obviously, we won't get to the end of it. But if you find that I am going on about a subject and it's not interesting to you, just simply look over to my right, your left, and you'll see somebody playing Mario 64 really well. <laughs> and what's important to note about this, actually, though, is that it is now 10 years since Mario 64 was created. And it's also 26 years roughly, since uh, Mario, the character with Nintendo, first came into being. And we are well into the 106th year of Nintendo, which was created in 1899 to sell playing cards. Um, Nintendo actually translates to leave luck to heaven. Um, anyway, so the name of this talk is The Wheel of Computer History, and if it wasn't on the program, that's fine. It didn't exist an hour ago. And... It's got two pieces to it. First is an introduction to the concept of computer history as I see it, and the other part is just where I'm going to leave a little bit of it up to you, and if people want to come up and ask me to pontificate on a specific computer history subject, I'll do that. Um, again, my name is Jason Scott. I'm known now for doing the BBS documentary because it's pretty and it has video in it, but most people know me because I'm the guy who created textfiles.com which is a collection of bulletin board system era text files and before that is at this point an unusually popular site. I'm at a half million unique visitors a month now. Um, and they come for various reasons. And one of the reasons that that happens is because there are over, well, there's well over a million files now, but there are different types. So there's ones on computers, there's pictures, there's old stuff from ham radio days. And people just go in, grab the thing they need, and walk away. Sometimes people come in, see something cool, and just refer everyone else to it. I kind of like this situation. In other words, functioning as both a place where history is collected and as kind of a reference point on the Internet where people can grab things works out well for me. I'm a very big fan of primary sources. I'm a big fan that it's 
if you can't get the person who did something getting his writings works really well, then you get into people who wrote about that person, and then you get people writing about people who wrote about that person. After a certain number of layers, you start to have problems. You start to have a signal-to-noise ratio. So I'm a really big fan of going out and grabbing the old stuff. So this talk is called The Wheel of Computer History, again. The Wheel of Computer History will refer to two things. First of all, it will refer to the fact that, like Wheel of Fortune, people will come up and hit me with old things. Uh, but it's also about the fact that computer history, in its own way, is very cyclical. It's extremely cyclical because it includes people. That's the one constant through all of computer history, is that generally people were involved. So because of that, people's natures... Uh, you know, there are certain cultural mores and beliefs that people have that kind of stick around. Sometimes there's different ones. For instance, um, a trivia off the top of my head, here's a good example of a cultural change. Uh, FidoNet, which is a network of computer bulletin boards that flourished heavily in the 80s and early 90s and is still around today, worked by allowing a bunch of single person's computers to dial other ones in what were first kind of a uh, point to point, any point to any point, and then later a hub and spoke model um, to send messages worldwide. And it was all done using the telephone network. Well, okay, it was officially done using the telephone network and was done by amateurs officially and was basically the largest amateur computer network that ever existed. And this is all interesting in its own fashion. In fact, I ended up doing an episode on it because it was such a complicated subject. But uh, I had the pleasure of being given a bunch of primary sources by Tom Jennings, the founder of FidoNet. And in it, it included a lot of his private emails, a lot of his early sketches, and so on. And I put them all online. One which struck me rather interesting was a person who wrote, um, on the side of all this, Tom Jennings is gay. Uh, he has a husband named Josh who he's been with for 25 years. And um, there was a letter to him. Well, first of all, there were two letters. There was a letter from somebody named Josh in Seattle who Tom Jennings didn't know, who said, could you please give the last name of your boyfriend because my computer system can't stay up anymore because people are attacking my computer system and getting my phone line disconnected to get rid of the gay guy. And the other one was a letter from somebody working at Digital saying, we're no longer going to pass Fidonet mail. Have fun, ladies. Where it actually was signed with a digital.com address. And that's in um, late 88. So you can imagine today if somebody from Google.com said, we're not going to allow you queers on our network and signed it with a Google.com email address. Um, so there are, some, there are cultural differences that do show up, but nowadays there are other reasons that people will say, you can't come on our network, you can't play with our game. And that uh, we're currently seeing a lot of that with World of Warcraft right now because World of Warcraft is kind of smashing through a whole bunch of other barriers. People are playing World of Warcraft and becoming computer addicts who weren't the type before. So one of the interesting aspects of that is that they are running into the same issues of time management, hygiene management, interaction with others, and um, choosing priorities that a whole generation of teenagers had to in the 1980s when they suddenly found this machine that would never shut off. You know, because, uh, again, that goes back to television, because what you had initially with television uh, as it hit the public early was that it only broadcast for certain portions of the day. So theoretically, you had time off. And then over time, the television networks go to 24 hours. Now, granted, through the 1960s and 1970s, those off hours suck, you know, they're extremely dirged with just bad reruns or long, endless nothings, things that have now been replaced by pay-per-view commercials or so on. So there were kind of also downtimes of like, well, we're just going to play the odd couple six times and we're done for the day. But now you will literally have today new content generated 24 hours a day for your pleasure and edification in 30 different channels. People say there's 300 channels and nothing on, and the answer is, well, there's, there is stuff on, but it's all kind of falls into the same cyclical pattern of like, well, what kind of show do we do? We do a show about our subject. Well, we don't have enough of them, so let's go buy from this central content, and that's why everyone plays WKRP Cincinnati. There's a, there's a channel in, in um, Canada called Book Television. You can always tell when a, tele when a channel is about to kind of go south when they start having stuff not related to the subject show up, and that means that they're trying to once again consolidate and commodify. That has nothing to do with computer history. The, 
but it is, it is interesting to me because, once again, uh, when I hear people say things like, what is computer history? For some people, this is computer history. I mean, there are people who will be at this con who literally this came out when they were 10 uh, or they were 9. And there will be other people who will be in college and other people who will have gotten, they, they got this and they bought it with their Social Security check. So it, it ranges heavily. Um, and so for some people, um, you'll see people say, well, five years ago, back in the old days. And then there'll be people who are like, ha-ha, I remember 10 years and 20 years. Uh, and I do have to point out, my area of expertise is computers from about 1970 up through the present day. When I speak of things before, I have to fall into the canon. I'll talk about the canon in a moment. But I have to fall into the canon. So if you talk to me about, you know, you talk to me about the Auric or you talk to me about um, uh, Atari, you talk about, you know, uh, let's see, if you go anywhere up through Nintendo's computers, um, computers, and you go up through consoles, fine. But I've had the pleasure of spending time in computer historians who go back to the 30s and the 40s, and they can kick my ass back then. Because, of course, like now, there were always companies interacting, trying to promote computers as being useful in a certain way. Their, their audience slowly spread out greater and greater. But again, a lot of the same promises, a lot of the same suggestions. Uh, so as a result, for instance, you'll see that whenever a new technology it comes out, the first thing that people indicate is that it's very useful in the kitchen. Uh, nowadays, the kitchen is the living room because that's the way life has changed for us, right? Our, kitchen is our, our living rooms are our kitchens now. They're our most functional room in the house. Um, but it's the same idea, the kitchen, the hearth, the, the central area of your cabin is where the computer is, and so that's where you want to use this new thing we just came out with that's wireless and it's purple and it blinks and it tells everyone who you are for four miles around your house. So, um, again, you know, that's just, in the old days, the ham radio antenna told people who you were, the guy to stay away from. Because um, anyone who's going to put a 60-foot antenna on the back of his house... Don't go on his property. Um, but anyway, so um, when I first started kind of collecting computer stuff, I was 12. Uh, this would be 1982. 81, I had first gotten into modems, and in 82, I started collecting things. I can't quite explain why at 12, when I still thought I was immortal, that I was still collecting all of this wonderful stuff that I would see. Other people would go to these bulletin boards and go on and read information given to them. Everyone here know what a bulletin board system is? Do we have anyone here who doesn't know? Just go like this for a moment. Okay. Um, okay, so I don't have to explain that. Um, a computer bulletin board uh, at the time being a single user experience could come and go very quickly, especially because they were run for fun. Not, not actually dissimilar to how websites are now in terms of how quickly some will stay around forever and be considered uh, you know, pillars of the community and other ones are gone the minute you find them. Uh, one disadvantage now we have is that we're getting such a critical mass of people who can actually hit a site that it's possible now with organization to destroy one upon its popularity. It used to be that cycle was, wow, peop more people are calling, more people are calling, and now I can't get on that bulletin board system. That cycle now can take literally four minutes where enough people are told that there's a picture of a guy who's setting something on fire and within four minutes, that's it. It's over. Um, and one of the things that has changed over time is the increase in speed for what used to take a long time. So, for instance, in the old days, you might have a, uh, uh, well, obviously, uh, audio and video have changed radically. Even in the last five years or the last ten years, I had the displeasure of having to go through some old, uh, CD-ROMs. I collect old shareware CD-ROMs. Even though they're scumbags, um, I collected them because they unwittingly became collectors and archivists of a certain time. So they may have sat around and gone to bulletin board systems and downloaded every public domain file they could and then sold it back to you for thirty-nine ninety-five. But on the other hand, they were sometimes the only ones doing that to such a great degree. So people now send me these shovelware CDs, and I put them up on cd.textfiles.com, which has 1,210,000 of them. And one of the things that happens is that I end up using my own archives as my reference material. Um, you see a lot of situations when people talk about computer history to go, oh, this is the way it was. And that's a very problematic position to take, and I try not to do that anymore, because what ends up happening is it ends up being either the way you perceived it was, 
or the way you were told how someone else perceived it was. And anybody who spends time with the primary sources will find, well, no, the story is a little more complicated than that. Uh, there's a lot of what I call the shadow second man. Often when you have a situation where you're like, this guy did this, the answer is yes, him and his four buddies. Uh, to my great discovery, uh, the, the original text adventure, Adventure, was created by Will Crowther and later by Don Woods, who took the original and made modifications. Um, there's actually some contention as to what month it came out, enough that Will Crowther doesn't know. But in interviewing Don Woods and spending time at his house, I found out the names of three other people who helped him program it. And not just, hey, it's broken, fix it, but literally like, hey, I added thief code today. Hey, I added the description today. There are actually three collaborators who have never been listed anywhere, who apparently are fine with it because they're all live, but now I'm going to go do my best to find these guys. I wouldn't have found that out anywhere in any text. I could only find that out by speaking with Don Woods, who is in his 60s, who therefore will not be around as long as ostensibly I am. So he, if he's not contacted and spoken to and recorded and talked to, pieces of information kind of flitter away, and then it becomes Crowther and Woods, and then boom. I love you too. Oh, hey, he wants you. So... Um, in uh, 100 meter crawl. The uh, anyway. So the point is, the point I, I, when I say that is that in, when you look on things online, um, I have been spending a lot of time these days discussing online sources of information because what I am finding more and more is what I'm starting to call the gray goulash of information. It's not so much elitism; it's just a recognition that people are more and more disinterested in primary sources in computer stuff. They want, they'll have what they call their pet wrong facts that people will take pleasure in saying, well, you're wrong. You know, there wasn't, it wasn't, uh, you know, Sega wasn't a Japanese company. It was a company founded by an American in Japan. And they'll be very proud of themselves. But they won't know anything about Sega's early electronics work in electromechanical equipment that they moved away from as they found that they were able to make more money in uh, arcades, you know. And maybe people don't care about that, but the thing is is that if you're going to play the game of, well, I have more accurate information than you, there's a lot of argument for going all the way to the end of it and saying, well, then I'm going to get lots of accurate information about it. Um, so that's why I mostly focus these days on primary source collection, grabbing old um, booklets, old documents, people, things people wrote, and... Um, to go back to what I said about canon, I often rarely do that, by the way. If I say I'm going to get back to something, that's a lie. Um, when I say canon, what ends up happening is that history tends to freeze itself over time. People need a shorthand because they're not as interested in what happened 400 years ago as they are what happened 50, 10, and 5 minutes ago. You know, if you see a car accident outside, it matters to you very much who hit who. Within 10 years, all that matters is that you know, there was a car accident and a guy died. Within 50 years, it's barely interesting, except for that's where they built the new Jiffy Mart. And then within 100 years, you're screwed. I don't think you're going to find anybody who even remembers that cars hit people like that. So, you know, it's one of those things where there's just a perspective. Um, and what ends up happening is that there's almost a wheel of fortune to that. It's whoever got the most noise. For instance, uh, a common misperception is that Captain Crunch discovered the Captain Crunch whistle, which is not, just not true. John, John Draper knew people who had made this discovery. It's just that John Draper is the one who was the most willing to talk to the press, specifically an, a reporter from Ramparts magazine, which was a short-lived pseudo-anarchist. Actually, it had kind of a... a up in, it's one of those magazines which kind of changes its focus over time so that at one point it was kind of you know, free information, but previously it was more like, here's the happenings in our town. Anyway, they did a report uh, by Ron Rosenbaum called Secrets of the Little Blue Box, which still gets passed around, which mentions Captain Crunch quite prominently, and the reason why is because Joe Ingressia didn't want to talk to him, the, the Midnight Skulker didn't want to talk to him, but Captain Crunch was willing to. This made Captain Crunch a target. This is part of why he ended up getting arrested a few times and why he holds some of the fame that he does now. He's a very smart, he's a very brilliant man, but he did not discover this whistle. But even to this day, I will read articles by reporters and articles by people and messages where they'll go, when Captain Crunch discovered the Crunch Whistle. So, does that matter? 
to some extent. Uh, when people like Dr. Holt work on their computer history, they have to work off of previous sources. One of the most common ways that that's done is that's using books. And of course, since people don't like to have books written about what they are, defining them, sometimes these books are kind of written in a vacuum. So uh, there's a particularly horrible book out, which I have not had the chance to truly trash, called um, Confessions of Teenage Hackers. Uh, it is horrible. I consider it one degree above child exploitation. He essentially speaks to a bunch of um, children, barely children, has them define their lives as heroes, and then gives them incredible superpowers uh, describing how they work. And I started to do research on, well, did this really happen? And it was like, wow, this one's not accurate, this one's not accurate, now I'm bored because I'm fine anyway. So for instance, he gave an example of a young female hacker and indicated how on her first time playing at this DEF CON event, she won the event, showing some sort of superpower, right? She's the classic kung fu story of the young unexpected hero that rises up and beats. It's a great story too, and it ends with good music. But the, 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 the thing is, is that when I looked it up, what happened was, was that it was a, a typically run kind of loose, DEF CON party. At the end, there were no winners, and they did a hands over the head, who wins this? And she won. Yeah, so in that way, it's kind of like a kung fu story, actually. One girl. So anyway, so it's a case there where to discover that, I had to go read a an awful lot of forum messages go through a lot of websites to find that, websites that are dying and going away. So what you end up with there is a case where that book, which is hardbound, which means it's going to take a long time to dissolve in the earth, is uh, going to be used as a primary source and is being used as a primary source. It's full of lots of statements like, um, after six months he knew all there was to know about hacking. You know, just phrases like that that are very useful if you don't know anything and you're reading because it sounds like you're learning about somebody who's a killer. But in fact, it's not true. Additionally, here's an example that particularly pisses me off. There's a subject in their reporting involvement with the LOD busts of 1990, uh, which became known as the, the hacker crackdown, related to an AT&T switch crash, which uh, occurred, I don't know, how many people know about this thing in some vague fashion? Okay, how many people know this in a really exacting fashion? How many people were in the room when it happened? Okay, so, oh my God. What happened was, there were a few lines of, there was an, there was an um, I forget the exact term. It's a term in C. It was basically an, a, a poorly executed loop in some code. And what happened was, was that they upgraded the code in January of 1990. And when the code went in, and I mean, there, it's known exactly what code this was. It, was, it went to an upgrade, and the upgrade caused it to overflow, and the switch crashed. And what this did was, this exploited an unexpected bug, which caused the nearby switch to go, I'll take over for him, oh shit, down. And then it started to cascade. So they pulled back the versioning, or they were able to isolate the problem enough to get the, the switches back up. But this caused an extremely uh, visible uh, destruction of the phone system. Enough that a number of investigations that were going on due to a woman named Gail Thackeray located in Arizona, uh, which were being kind of pushed through and let's watch them and what could possibly go wrong with these people. It doesn't hurt to keep an eye on them. Suddenly there was a press of get somebody for that. And so they busted the Legion of Doom. And this became the subject of Bruce Sterling's book, The Hacker Crackdown. Um, now the thing is, is that within seven days they knew exactly what code had broken in the versioning, right? I mean, within seven days of January, they knew that this problem was related to a C code. But they had already kind of gone through with the busts and the resultant kind of broken lives that were going on with that. Now, in a mere 12 years later, in this book, Confessions of Teenage Hackers, he describes how the Legion of Doom took down the phone system on January, and that it caused a hacker crackdown on this community. 
So here we have two problems, right? A, by using the phrase hacker crackdown, he's betraying the fact that he kind of glanced at the book. And B, he has forgotten the core concept of the first chapter of the book, which means that he didn't get through the first chapter. <laughs> he and I have had very unpleasant emails, um, um, mostly involving him, that I'm mostly him questioning my priorities. So, uh, but when the things is that when the chips are down, people start to look at the canon. They start to say, oh, this happened, right? Oh, Socrates, he drank some hemlock because of something. He was, he was um, convicted of corrupting the youth. Right, exactly. And that is probably somewhat true. But Socrates also was the guy who said that the proper age for a wife was 18 when you were 34 because he had just married an 18-year-old when he was 34. Doesn't get out as much, does it? No. <laughs> Corrupting youth. Anyway, hemlock. So the thing is, is that what does that do? What, what, why is that? Why is the history like that? And sometimes it's to serve a function. It's because it tells a story that says, if you think too much, you will be killed. Good thing we don't have that happen too much anymore. And it's a very efficient story. And it says, maybe you should think more, but try not to drink the hemlock. So it gets usable as a parable, right? But it's not historically accurate. Now, there's a wonderful man who writes books. His name is um, Tom Standage, and he has written four books, uh, all of them brilliant and what I think a good history tends to be. He's got one on things people have drunk over the years, The History of the World in Six Glasses by Tom Standage. He's got one about telegraphs that is astounding called The Victorian Internet, where he shows, uh, where he, again, culling from original sources, shows how, because you had to charge by the word, uh, an entire book language popped up where they would start to have 10 to 15 letters, and the 10 to 15 letters would be a full and complete order for a store. So you would have AZZ52 means literally buy five bushels from this particular vendor and deliver it by this point. And there was a lawsuit because they messed up a letter and the guy bought 5,000 instead of 500. So the courts, by the way, said fuck you to the guy who was suing because it was like, well, you know, if you were sending human messages, you would have noticed they misspelled dough. And, you know, so he lost that. But Tom Standage goes ahead and finds all of these wonderful original stories of, um, you know, the pride that was held by telegraph operators in their job. And that once machines came in to take away the need for a person, that it went from being one of the most esteemed and beloved wizard positions in technology to being the lowest form of uh, drudge work and not worthy of anyone. So there are parallels everywhere, and he finds them. He has two other books. One is on the Mechanical Turk, which was the chess-playing machine from the 17th century. And there's a book on Neptune and the story of Neptune. Brilliant piece of work, again, because he goes down and discovers the two-week period when this guy was going to, when, when this head of this scientific group in England knew that the French were about to discover Neptune, but he had a guy who he was waiting on to discover Neptune, so he kind of lost the information about this other guy and didn't let this other guy see the information so that when he discovered it, as he was very close to doing, they could go, we discovered it. And he discovers, and he, he grabs this down to like the week of like Monday. He goes on a trip Friday, and that's very exciting because so often before it's just oh a guy discovered Neptune by using mathematical calculations, and he goes into all the detail. Some people don't want to know the detail, and that is entirely fine. In fact, one of the great things about the modern world is that we have the ability to block everything out. There's some stuff that we can't block out, but that's usually when we enter public space. But when we enter private space, we're actually pretty good at it because usually our switches work. So we can turn shit off. And there's a great benefit now to being able to turn stuff off. But there's also a benefit to being able to get as much actual information as you want. And there's a lot of what I said, gray goulash. Goul when I'm using the phrase gray goulash, first of all, you don't like eating shit that's gray. That's the first thing. But the other thing is that in a goulash, as opposed to a soup, in a soup, all of the component things are mostly unrecognizable. Like, you can sort of tell probably this was a chicken at some point. But with a goulash, there's just enough pieces in it for you to convince yourself that what you're getting is a chicken. Because there's big 
huge hunks of chicken. And so I'm getting a chicken. It's like, no, you're getting a recombine chicken soup liquid gel. So, you know, a lot of times now that's what we're getting when you say stuff. Uh, I'll only say it once. This is what you get with Wikipedia. Um, I'm giving a lot of... I'm now known as a pretty heavy Wikipedia critic, and I'm being flown around a few places this year to go speak. That's why I didn't make this speech on Wikipedia. I'm being flown to a few places this year to speak about Wikipedia. And a lot of it just comes down to it's being used and held up as a good source of information, and that's not true. Now, can good information be gotten from it? Yes. If there's one thing computer people are very good at doing, it's basically filtering out shit, right? So you watch a movie that's filmed with some handheld jerk kind of aiming it at an event, you're good at like, okay, I saw a shirt and it's, it was two people who did it, right? You, your brain is built to do that, to, to demarcate out the information you need. But you can't compare what the shot is to being there or talking to someone who's being there. You're seeing this, you can, you can often have a case where somebody will go, well, the Wikipedia article says this, and it's like, yes, there are people who are working very hard to destroy the information in Wikipedia. Wikipedia has a problem with um, information that doesn't exist being added to it. There's no real uh, mechanism within the architecture to prevent somebody from adding false information and giving false citations that don't exist on the internet. Anyway, so when I talk about history to people, I always say there's three layers. When I did the bulletin board system documentary, there were a lot of times that I was sitting in the room with the guy who did the thing, and they'd get it wrong. And I knew they got it wrong. But part of that was like age, part of that was interaction, part of that was just w what time in their lives this happened. You know, going back 25 years, people start to build up a story about themselves. I discovered this because I have a girlfriend who's no longer a girlfriend who has... Um, photographic memory. She can tell you what I wore every day we were dating. You know, and so a lot of times I'll say to her, boy, well, we had a good time with this. And she's like, no, we really didn't. You said this and this, and I did this and this. It was horrible. But in my mind, oh, I, was, I was a gent. So, you know, it's part of the reason why some people don't like photographs and movies and stuff that belie what actually happened. Um, so in talking to people, though, one of the advantages and why I would put up full interviews that I did was that sometimes I found people, again, three layers. There's the history that people think of being the history of things. You know, for, um, Fernando Marcos was deposed or whatever. Then there's the actual history, something that a person in a palace with Ferdinand Marcos would tell you about this person doing this and, and um, uh, here's where we started to see the cracks. And then there's the actual history, which nobody may know. Like, sometimes people are very good at lying to themselves about what they were. And if that's the case and you were the only person there, we're screwed, right? Where did this idea come from? I spent some time, there's a game called... Um, well, nowadays it's called Pimp Wars. Previously it was called Drug Wars. Before that it was called Dope Wars. It was created by a guy named John Dell. I spoke with John Dell. What a pleasurable thing that was. I spoke to this man. Ironically, he does programming for an anti-drug bureau. But beyond that, he created it back when he was in elementary school. Actually, sorry about that. High school as part of a programming thing. He did it because he saw a commodities training program. And he kind of said, well, this would be cooler if it had drugs in it. And he submitted it. Hmm? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> just J-A-D, just add drugs. So um, <laughs> we, have a, we have a J-A-D extension to the new browser, just add drugs, and it works fine. So, yeah, exactly. So um, the, the thing is, though, is that when I put up his interview in which I had his claim that he was like, oh, I saw this come out of these program. I had someone post after it who was basically, no, it's a complete fucking ripoff of Taipei. Uh, it includes this, which is from Taipei. It has this from Taipei. Now, we have a situation there, right? This is the guy who created Drug Wars saying, I created it this way. And we have another person, who I don't know, saying, it was created this way. And I went and looked up Taipei because I have the primary... 
I've got a lot of ROMs. And I've got a lot of ROMs because it's the easiest way in some ways to track back. You know, who created this, who did what. you got proof right back there because back in 82, if somebody's working on Ultima 17, they're not going to go, well, if I do this in 20 years, that'll show this kid. So you get that, if you're lucky, you get that advantage. Um, another problem, though, is that over time, right, I mean, there's been a lot, like, like everyone kind of knows, right, that the George Washington cherry tree thing isn't true. Um, there's a whole thing with that where it was added by a guy in the fourth or fifth edition of his biography of George Washington that he wrote 15 years after George Washington died. So the book sales were kind of flagging, and then he added a few stories. And a quote that is attributed to him is, there's a lot of money in the bones of old George. And it's true. So uh, that story now is told. I mean, I was told it by my teacher, my idiot teacher. Um, I can recall a number of my teachers telling me things that I just know aren't true. But the thing is, the teacher works on a very high-level thing of, like, let's try to make these kids not drool on themselves within a week or two of leaving my classroom. So they have a very set, you know, sometimes... And, and a part of that, of course, is just because, you know, when you have 30 kids, you've got such a spectrum, you can't focus on... You've got to kind of, like, nobody died! So... Um, Anyway, getting back to um, drug wars and dope wars, when you look up Taipei, the answer is yes. Taipei seems somewhat very similar, actually, to drug wars. And so um, what might have happened, and I speculated this, was that the commodities trading program ripped off Taipei because at the time, which is now forgotten, stealing game ideas was completely kosher and very uh, lucrative. You know, there was Pac-Man, there was Puck-Man, there was Dot-Man, there was whatever. Fucking great! Look at that, it runs! What a fascinating thing! It actually functions on a box. And the fact that, you're, that some, somebody wrote something for your TI-99 was a great thing. And so the fact that it's a Pac-Man game reflex, who cares? It runs! You know, what a great thing. Nowadays, they're starting to sue for, you know, I mean, well, yes, fine. Back in nineteen mid eighties when Atari was really fuckers and really owned by Warners, they sued Odyssey for somebody because they licensed Pac Man and there was a much better one called Casey Munchkin and they sued Casey Munchkin because they said they stole our idea. But that didn't always work. So in the time that Taipei and Drug Wars, it would be totally kosher to take this kind of basic gaming system and kind of screw around with it, and so that a young John Dell would see this new program that kind of ripped it off and say, I can convert this for my game program. He tells me he, he gave the floppy disks to two people in California in 1982. Never put it on a bulletin board, never gave it to anyone else. Doesn't have it himself. And now, there are literally thousands of copies of it. Now, 20 years later. So, it's interesting how some things live and some things die in that way. Um, all right, so, just to conclude my introduction, although I, I've been told I have not too much time left. Um, so what I'm saying is that uh, I think that there is an incredible benefit in computer history and to expand what that definition is, that sometimes there are uh, cases where people use computer history as a justification for current actions. Of course we can do this, they did it, now we get to do it. And that usually tends to be a rather clever remixing of sorry what do they say now mashing up of an original idea so that they're saying well you know in the old days the founding fathers did this and it's like yes but the founding fathers smelled like perfume and there was no hygiene and people couldn't it was a multi-day process to get milk from somebody nearby and, you know, there's like lots of other contingencies that kind of modify this original idea. And if you decontextualize it, if you remove it, in the National Archives is the original blood-stained program that Abraham Lincoln was holding when he got shot. It's in a bag if you want to go visit it. Useful to have, I guess. You want to know what it is? Hmm? Let's clone him. Exactly. Well, you never know. Might tell you something. It might tell you something about that now you might be able to pull something from that blood that tells you something else about Lincoln that you did not know about a, you know, a disease he had, something that was, or the fact that he was a woman. <laughs> anyway, this is just a new theory of mine. Abraham Lincoln was a woman. That's a pretty good one. That's a pretty good, excellent general theory to have. You just say, well, you know, I've got some groundbreaking news. What? Yeah. yeah. Look at <laughs> Abraham Lincoln, once known as... Honest Babe. Honest Babe. 
the Abraham Lincoln you never knew. Uh, anyway, so let's just play a very quick game here. It's called uh, Wheel of Computer History. How's he doing? Is he kicking some ass? Look at him. He's at 31 stars, that motherfucker. It's kind of funny, this, this entire um, subculture is called speed runs, where there are actually, and, and again, I like subcultures, there are speed runs in computers, and the idea is that you take these games that are somewhat old, and you go through them as absolutely fast as possible, sometimes utilizing tricks, bugs, and other problems to get through. It is popular enough that it is already substrated, and that's always a sign that something's too big when you start having substrated. Oh, he's a kernel hacker. No, he's a device driver, kernel hacker. Anyway, so um, in this, there's what's called tool-assisted speed runs, and there's regular speed runs. He is playing a regular speed run. He is simply playing like a motherfucker as fast as he can. But tool-assisted means that they would play at half speed, would utilize save points, would use an emulator, so that they could play at app. Like, there is no missed move, no unusual anything. And some people consider that cheating. Other people go, that's a work of art. I mean, if when you watch a Mario bounce between 100 enemies in the Super Mario Brothers 3 example, where he actually bounces on 100 bullets, getting a new play, you know, getting a one one up each time, it's a work of art, regardless of how it was created. It's beautiful. So one can argue. So uh, anyway, so as you can see, every everything is cyclical, right? Everything is cyclical. Anyway, so. If anybody has a subject they think they want me to talk about for a minute or two, I will gladly take any requests about that. One of the side effects of my spending way too much time with textfiles.com and an awful lot of other things is that I end up learning a lot of trivial bullshit. And it has no place in any talk whatsoever. Hit me up with your question. Real quick, what do, do you know anything about the shift between calling it cybernetics and calling it computing? Um... My dad has a book uh, from, I think it was 40s or 50s. Uh, it was a, basically um, the, the transcripts of a conference on cybernetics, but it's right. fake computers. There's, was actually, there's a beautiful old uh, one written by Weizenbaum, I believe, about computer ethics, the, fu- the coming future of computer ethics that he wrote in the 40s. Um, one of the pleasures that I had, actually, was that there was a... Uh, it's reading up... Uh, bear in mind, I'm kind of a math retard. I never took math past the 10th grade. There's a lot of basic math functions I don't understand, and sometimes to do something, I will do a whole bunch of stuff, and someone will go, oh, you mean this function? Mm-hmm. Oh, well. So I didn't really understand where regular expressions came from, that there was a field of mathematics where they were having trouble tracking the numbers because you had to be able to say, you couldn't just say, Take 1 through 1,000. You had to say, well, take 1 through 1,000, except for where the number multiplies this way or has a 5 on the end. Well, how do, you, how do you put that in a paper and not make it a friggin' mess? So a language called regular expressions was created to be able to say, oh, t- say you take this, and that would enable you to, to demarcate this as being a certain set of numbers. And it was an entire language. And one of the architects of Unix whose name I'm now unfortunately forgetting at the top of my head, um, had read this paper when he was in school. So when they were working on string matching and stuff, he said, I'm going to use that old mathematics language. That was kind of neat. I'm going to use it for matching stuff in here. So he was using stuff before the computers could do it to do this computer. And and I wrote him to basically say, you are a badass. I think this was like 2004, I think I wrote him. Like, dude, you are a badass. It's nice that you can actually, you know, like... I have the email address of the guy who invented pinball flippers. <laughs> That's nice to have. Hey, pinball flipper guy! Made those pinball flippers. Because pinball didn't originally have flippers. That's what made it a gambling game, and that's why it kept getting busted, because it would give you money at the end. It was basically a really slow sh- slot machine. And they invented flippers partially to get away from saying that we were, we, were not, we were not games of chance. We were games of skill. Just like poker, apparently. So, um... The, the being able to write to this guy who created Unix and co-created Unix. I think it was Richie. I think it was Richie I wrote too. It might have been the other one. No, it has to be the other one. Not Richie. Huh? Yep. Wrote to him and said, thank you for being such a badass and thinking so far ahead in this way because there aren't that many brilliant people I run into and you're one of them. Thank you. Anyway, so he said, I get these occasionally. I don't know what to do with them. 
Thanks back. Again, what did he do when someone just, hi, you are a badass, I have nothing else to contribute. So anyway, um, there is a lot of research that's done prior to computers taking over to the, like nowadays, right, we have a, we have a, a beautiful amount of information we can pull from, right? I mean, if you want to write a script that takes news articles and tries to demarcate what geographic area they're in and make a flash animation that shows you where the new information is coming, there's a lot of news articles coming in. That wasn't always the case. That means you would have previously had to type in the articles out of your newspaper and then run them against something that you might not have been able to get the information to to be able to figure out where, where is this town located and so on. Because you might only, Anyway, so the point is, is that nowadays we're at such a... We, the good part of our lives in all that information is that there's a lot of cool crap to play with, whereas before you kind of had to say, one day, upon the entrance of cool crap, this thing can be done to it, which is what a lot of Weizenbaum's work is in computer ethics and so on. Um, so the cybernetics thing moves away towards computing, I want to say, in the 50s, but the thing is is that computers as a... I have a book called... Um, history of computer, early computer networks, and it's all these online systems, literally dozens and dozens that existed in the 60s and the 50s. They had their own names, their own people on it, and 12 people could get to them, and they cost millions of dollars. And they were all run like kind of internal to different companies and different groups and parts of the army. But we don't think of those. The first thing we think of is CompuServe or The Source or America Online, which used to be Quantum Link, which used to be Game Master, which used to be a couple other things. So Zilox. Zai, the two-headed Atari 2600 cartridge. Anyway, supercharger. So, um, that's interesting to me in terms of the fact that there's a lot of precursors where, like I said, they don't have the stuff yet, so they have terms for it. I love reading the books where they say, this is what life will be like, and then reading and going, you were wrong. There's a wonderful documentary that's now on YouTube, I think, well, it was last I checked, called uh, Hyperland, which has, it's written by Douglas Adams, it stars Douglas Adams and Tom Baker, and it talks about the coming hypertext revolution. It was written in, it was created in 1990, and it's got a bunch of stuff talking about it. And some of the stuff is absolutely true, and some of it is total bunk, but not a lot. For instance, they are really big on the concept of the Micon, which was the movable icon, which was an icon that had little animation. We discovered now that people hate that shit. <laughs> Because standardly, the moving thing on the screen is trying to sell you something. You know, that's the thing, right? It's a, hey, asshole, buy this. It's nice. It'll make your penis big. So, um, but there's other stuff in there where, lo where they have him clicking through all of these events and people are talking and then an icon pops up and he clicks on the icon. And he's like, this is all very confusing. And he's like, yes, it is. Isn't it great? And... Their satellites are real-time, the satellite view. He shows you clicking through and looking at the satellite real-time, but we now know that right now that's not very efficient for Google Earth. But Google Earth exists. So, uh, not bad, huh? Anyway, uh, do we have another one? I think there was somebody else who had one. Yeah, I have a question. Sure. What books would you recommend for computer history and the early computer history is especially? The stuff that happens before most... People well, I, computers are around. I recommend uh, Victorian Internet by Tom Standage. Okay. Uh, Hacker Crackdown is good, although it gets some of the names wrong and it gets some of the facts wrong. But it's a very, it, it's probably one of the better ones, a better attempt anyway to tell that story. Um, a lot of times, I'm more obviously I'm more concerned with books that are crap um, because they end up becoming part of the canon. Um, <laughs> There are books where it becomes extremely useful because you can see how people perceived things and where we went differently. So as a result, there's Future Shock by Alan Topher. There is uh, the new, the, I have, it, I have it, the coming, what's that? Oh, okay, if it's like that. Uh, the Coming Micro Millennium is a book that came out uh, that tells you in 14 years you'll be able to store all of the world's information on the head of a pin kind of stuff that's very interesting because you can see where the priorities are uh, just to deflect for one minute I have a uh, theory thing that I've been working through with um, which says that a lot of the th a lot of the computing story can be told as uh, basically wouldn't it be neat if hey we did it 
oh my God, it killed somebody. <laughs> and you can see this in a lot of technology, land technology. Uh, you can see this in the creation of equipment where basically first somebody says, wouldn't it be neat if a bunch of computers could network? Then they do it. Then one of the computers on the network goes rogue and takes all the others down. So, for instance, uh, a good example is Doom, right? Doom. There's, there's, a, there's a game called Snipes, which pre includes Doom by many, many years. But let's go with Doom, because that's the one most people know, because that one, with Snipes at least, people were somewhat normal, but they had to be in the same room as you. But after Doom and Quake, where people didn't have to be in the same room as you, removing that one piece of human interaction, I mean, because if you're an asshole, the guy can come over and hit you with a soda can. <laughs> but without that immediate uh, response of shame, you end up with a, um, a bit more sociopathic approach. So what ends up happening is that in Quake, there is the brilliance and the work that John Carmack does to provide the minimal amount of information that can go across the wire to be able to have everyone have a shared experience. He knocks it down to a few bytes so it can say, this is where everyone's located, here's where the guns are. But that entire model falls apart when one of them is a blistering asshole because he can take the described experience, which is giving him hints he shouldn't have, and he can change his client so that he has an unbelievable advantage over the others. Fine, a game of Quake, good. Everyone else's skins are pure white, so now you can see them in the dark, so you play a little better, you're a jerk. But that's also the problem that we have with DNS. And that is also the problem with Ted Nelson's Xanadu project from the 1960s, which is a pre, not a precluded to hypertext. Ben of our Bush did hypertext, but he did a version of hypertext, and he wanted two-way links, and he wanted ownership of items. So here's how that would work. You would have a sentence that you wrote that was really fucking brilliant. Uh, 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 one, one, one from my college. Life is a series of great disappointments punctuated by periods of great depression. So t say I made that phrase on a, on a page. In Ted Nelson's world, you would be able to actually copy that, my, my statement, and you could drop it into your document. And if somebody clicked on that or did the motion to it, it would tell you that it was made by me, where it came from, and how to find me. That is to say, all pieces of information would have... That sounds fucking great! And if you write the thing, it's wonderful. And then the assholes come. Because the first thing a spammer will do is grab all the information he can do, put his ad in place, and start pasting it out in as many places as he can, getting his message out so people will buy his penis pills. <laughs> and you can guarantee that Ted Nelson didn't sit around in the early days going, oh, what about the penis pill issue? <laughs> the coming penis pill revolution. Um, you know... And the thing is, is that then what happens is that there's a scrambling period beyond the, oh, gee, this stuff works great, to, oh, God, what do we do now? We had no idea it explodes, but so many people are putting money in it, we're going to make it work anyway, right? That's basically the problem with SSL, is, okay, here's security so that you can buy your shit you were buying. They, oh, they broke it. We think this is better. We promise we'll refund your money. You know, you end up having to scramble to come up with solutions because you liked it so much and now the crack is in and you can't do anything about it because the money crack is coming. Um, so I think that, again, this is, this is one of these things that just kind of happens. And once you recognize it, you, you stop falling into the traps that we get lost into in this world where you'll say things like, um, somebody needs to def I need to defend my subculture because people will ruin it. And that happens all the time. It happened to bikers. It happened to flappers. It happens to people who used to do work in biochemistry. It worked in that way with sailors. It just was like people who don't understand our internal lingo are now in here doing stupid shit and destroying what we had that was so wonderful and special. And now it's ruined. And if we somehow hold on to the old opinions that we had and the old mores that no longer function because there's too many people in it, it'll all go back doesn't. So what you do instead is you say, using the knowledge I had before, I'm going to kick your ass again a whole new way. That's the way to go about it anyway. All right. That's all. I think we all have to get our dinner. One, one, two, two small announcements. Just whatever he has to say. And, and then Thank you. the other thing is, because wait, 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 the meal ticket. I'm selling copies of my BBS documentary, $40, three DVDs. It's a five-and-a-half-hour, five eight-episode series on the bulletin board system. And if you were able to stay awake through that, then you'll probably want it. Step three, profit. Okay, uh, actually, officially, we are doing dinner break. If you want to ramble more, feel free to do so. There's nobody up after you. Oh. 
If you want to, I'll talk. My internet penis is here. You are what you eat. Well, you know, the penis pills, which don't work, um, there was that case where they busted that company in, I think it was Arizona, for selling penis pills, and they had made three and a half million dollars selling penis pills. Why? So you can leave? Okay. Okay. That's fine. Yeah, go ahead. Do you know who Dana Boyd is? Yes, I do. Um, do you, uh, are you, can you are we speak dating? a little bit? Well, you'd be a pretty lucky guy, but um, if, if uh, can you speak a little bit about her context that she speaks about? She saw, saw, you were just talking about um, people screwing up, uh, you know. Um, the yeah. This, I don't, okay. I would not pretend to be an expert on what Dana Boyd has to say about communities, although she does have a lot of truck and a lot of coin coming in discussing communities and the problems. There's actually a much better, I'm sure she would appreciate me saying that, there was a somewhat better uh, article written about community. Community broke me. I, I finished my BBS documentary and discovered, nobody bought one. Um, I figured out this whole history of bulletin boards and community kind of shows up in the middle of it and I never knew about it. And it's almost like amoeba, amoeba, semi-auto truck, amoeba, amoeba. It's an extremely advanced Apple II based conferencing system that shows up five months after the first BBS and then died within a year. And the reason it died was because there was a local high school that had access to modems, and they pwned it. They pwned it so hard. They logged in, they were assholes, they couldn't figure out who they were, they couldn't track you know, where the calls were coming from, so they didn't know who, if this next one was gonna be a jerk, and eventually they just pulled the plug. And so this lady at a pagan conference came out with this talk about this early community about how this online community fell over on its ass because of all the... Anyway, so it's a very prescient discussion about community. Um, there's another one, and he and I actually have different opinions. The one who wrote... Um, I want to say it's Dan Gilmore who wrote about the tragedy of the commons and discussing how if you made things too open, people... He, he wrote things in a certain fashion, but yet he really likes Wikipedia. And what I think it is, is that the more I, I tried to understand that, why people have that problem, I think it's because, like Las Vegas, they like the idea often more than the actual thing. Because Las Vegas sounds like a great idea on principle, but for, I mean, I spend a week in Las Vegas every year, I love it, right? But I go to Las Vegas in a very specific fashion for my own specific needs that are probably kind of antithetical. I don't gamble and things like that. So... In similar ways, I think a lot of like Wikipedia, the fact that it's like, wow, this shouldn't exist, but it does, kind of that soap bubble kind of a deal, like, wow, this soap bubble is still going on, and when I go to it, it seems relatively accurate, and I'm surprised by the amount of work going into it, so it must be good kind of a deal. Like a lot of people are dropping teacups on it, and so now there's a huge pile of teacups, and you're like, wow, that's a lot of teacups, without really thinking, why is there a big pile of teacups here? Anyway, so, and, and, you know, and for a lot of things, it, it ends up becoming kind of the default, right? It kind of blows out. This was part of the issue with open source, right? Is that it's very hard to compete against free. And the only way to really compete against free is to say, I'm so good compared to the free thing that you'll want to give me money. And for the vast majority of people, they're like, it doesn't hurt that much to use the free thing. So they'll eat it, right? I mean, GCC is a bit of a mess, but it compiles stuff. So, good! I don't need to buy... Could it also be that there are factors that you don't understand that are, uh, that are, that are contributing to the, uh, the problem that are you, uh, well, I mean, are you saying, so maybe there's a reason I don't know that it's popular? I mean, you'll never get me to admit that. Oh, I see what you're saying. 
Well, yes, of course. There's a whole critical mass thing that Wikipedia does that nobody... Uh, how do I... They are the best free encyclopedia currently in existence that you can edit. Um, that, without a doubt. And the thing is that all of those represent barriers to competition. You know, uh, Citizendium will die. And, sit, and the part of the reason why Citizendium will die is because Sanger doesn't have the salesman ability that Wales does. I mean, Wales, right? I mean, Wales can point to a falling down house and say, great land, uh, free building supplies, <laughs> right? Um, you know, uh, bonus um, supplies. And that's important. You have to have somebody who, I mean, you know, people don't like Richard Stallman, but Richard Stallman has maintained truth to the point of hating his own organization on, on, on places to stay true to what he believes in. Whereas a lot of people, you know, it's pretty much wind, wind. So, you know, you get a lot of that. Um, I have no doubt that Wikipedia fulfilled. So part of the reason that I go off on Wikipedia, yes, I'm a fucking, fucking Wikipedia thing, um, is that I think that when it collapses into whatever it's going to collapse into, more things like it will happen, and people will hearken back to the good old days, just like they hearken to the good old days of Usenet before the great split, the great renaming of 1988. Um, some people think of it as being destroyed at that point, when it was suddenly the case that any asshole could create a group, and they pop it off to the alt group, and that's where you get alt.swedishchef.borked.borked.bork, which is where it all starts, and then you start seeing more like alt.fan.whatever.bitch, and things start adding, right? And it's funny because the whole Usenet thing has parallels to Wikipedia, but that's another case where people say, if we make enough rules, shit will be controlled. Right? With Usenet, there's a whole set of policies that you have to follow in the RFC to create a new group. But people started to create any group they wanted to. And even if it didn't fulfill it, and enough people fell into it that it was kind of cool that way. So yes, the answer is, what I say instead is, you can learn from what it was, and what happened to it in another four or five years? You go, where did Wikipedia fall down? Because I have people on the inside, and it's falling down. It's falling down very quickly. Uh, and it's not going to be the same. It can't, it can't sustain itself right now. It's dying on the inside. 4,000 articles are created every day. 2,000 articles are deleted every day. Um, they have internal names. Right now, you cannot start... You, right now, you cannot create a character whose first name is Willie and have him stay. He'll be deleted automatically by a bot, eventually. You can't use the word elephant in any article on Wikipedia because they will find it and remove it or change it or demarcate it, especially if you're new. There's a whole set of rules in place. Elephant? Colbert. The elephant article is still edited several times every hour because of Colbert. Still, years, uh, months later, still is. And, you know, Jimbo Wales, as a salesman, will point to it as like, ha-ha, look at the funny things that happens to us. But in fact, it's really causing destruction for them. I mean, literally. And, and, and they don't have much functionality in the way to handle directed quality vandalism. That is to say, they are creating super viruses. They're creating people who are really good at being such good hoaxers that they are undetectable. And then those people who are learning that at an early teenage age are going to use those skills in the new information age for their 20s and 30s. They will be able to lie to you and you will never know it, ever. Huh? And then sell a book. What? For what? For edit, for putting false, like putting things, oh, they, oh. they themselves invented, uh, you know, yeah. the periodic Yeah, but this is hardly the, the, yeah, this is hardly the environment to try to find people who disagree entirely with aspects of antisocial behavior. Because it encourages it, right? I mean, you've got a place where we have no problem bathing the entire place in rays that allow you to communicate to the internet from anywhere in the building there is no requirement to be in a location anymore. It's, and we like that. We're like, this is a fascinating... In fact, maybe we can do it from our car. Maybe we can drive by, stop, interact with the con from our car, and leave. Because some people want to do that. 
And olfactory-wise, it might be good. But the, <laughs> that would fix the smell problem, wouldn't it? Just everyone sits in their cars, and there's just a big screen with the presentation outside. Anyway, a drive-in con. Jesus Christ, that'd be fucking fascinating. <laughs> That'd be really good. I could see someone doing that. The only problem... Well, the only problem... No, you have those little things on your car. Anyway, so... Um, yeah, the only problem with that that's a problem is modifying the projector to be able to handle, like, to be able to get the line of sight with a... Because most, most 4K projectors even have the lumens issue outside. Anyway. That's true. But then why do you need the drive-in? <laughs> So they be, so they oh, wait! Because of the sugary food. Yes. Yeah. Because you need a little building full of fat people. Anyway, so, you see, if you work enough, if you work it out hard enough, you can actually, people are fun. So anyway, so, no, there's a certain, sa- there's a certain shame aspect with, with um, Wikipedia vandalization, which is part of the thing, but there's also a wondrous and great feeling because, because of its current fact that it's one of the 15 most visited sites on the Internet, if you're able to fuck with George Washington's article, you have fucked with George Washington, essentially, right? I mean, you have changed George Washington's um, uh, perception, you know, the perception of George Washington by the world, because people will hit that site and they will learn something. So, yeah. Have I been vandalizing Wikipedia? Hells yeah. I've been having a great time doing it, too. Sorry. <laughs> In fact, um, I'm giving a talk at Nauticon, the speech uh, next next to April, called Wikipedia Brick by Brick, and by the time I give that, that's, that's the bomb. So anyway, so you can look forward to that one. You know the ones where like they do something, and then it's, that thing stops happening after? That'll be what it is. Anyway, it'll be a great time. Just to, anyway. Um, so anyway, uh, God, enough about Wikipedia. God, it kills you, doesn't it? Anyway, uh, did we have any other things we wanted to hear me talk about? What's your website? I have several. Oh, that? bbsdocumentary.com. Textfiles.com has a link to it. Uh, Are there any other sites that are interesting right now? Gitlamp.com is the text adventure documentary. Yes. I'm speaking with uh, the creator of MUDS, Richard Bartle, in another couple of weeks, actually. Um, And I spoke to the creator of Legends of Future Past. I've also interviewed the author the creator and author of Choose Your Own Adventure books. Um, anyway, so yeah, no, you always try to expand out. That's why my documentaries, I try to make them better. Is Bartle the creator of Bartle is one of the creators of MUDs, yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm interviewing Bartle. He did it with other people for money, but yeah. Uh, he's basically it. He's certainly a, a grand, towering figure in that. And in fact, he told me he wrote a Choose Your Own Adventure book. Anyway. Choose Co. has DVDs, yes. And that's actually an extremely complicated story. You'll find more than once that when you have a situation where two people did something together and you interview them 30 years later, they hate each other's fucking guts. That's how Adidas and Puma came about. Because Adidas was the um, sneaker company owned by these three German brothers, the Door brothers, and one of them had a falling out and went down the road and created Puma. And they exist to this day, right? And... They are in competition with each other, and it was because these two brothers hate each other's fucking guts. Same thing with the Kelloggs, right? The the Will, that's an easy one, right? The Will and Harvey Kellogg issue, right? The W.H. Harvey and then there's Harvey Kellogg, and um, uh, one had a sanitarium, a Kellogg sanitarium, and he sold crushed cornmeal to keep down the sexual appetites and uh, increase fiber in his patients, and the other one said, we could sell this, so they created Kellogg's um, I forget the exact. I think it was Kellogg's Corn Flakes, but it might have been Oat Flakes. Anyway, was it Corn Flakes? And then, yeah. So W H leaves and goes on a holiday, and in the meantime, the other one starts putting sugar in it, which is complete anathema to the way the other one. And the two brothers didn't speak ever again. Thirty years they didn't talk. Um, but anyway, so with the Choose Your Own Adventure guys, there's like one original Choose Your Own Adventure guy, and then I spoke to him. And there's another guy, and they don't talk, and they hate each other. Well, not so much. He tells me he doesn't hate. That's a bad way to phrase. He told me specifically, I don't hate him. I hate George Bush. I don't hate him. <laughs> so, uh, but it comes down to there is a company called Choose Co. that 
pulled back the Choose Your Own Adventure trademark from the dirt because it had been dropped by Simon & Schuster and which now owns the rights to Choose Your Own Adventure. The guy who created Choose Your Own Adventure it was previously called The Book of You and before that it was called Sugar Cane Island and uh, created it in 1969 but it didn't get it published until 1975. And, uh, and that's a good example because I have spoken to someone who has essentially a doctorate in text adventures. And he tells me of, oh, of course, Choose Your Own Adventures were a complete uh, reference to programmatic books in this work. And I brought it up with the guy, and he's like, the what and the what? Because yeah. he was a lawyer who tells me that he got into Choose Your Own Adventure because he wasn't very good at telling stories. So he would keep asking his kids how the story would go next. And he thought, that's a pretty good way to tell a story. So he started, wrote this book. And all of he's, he has given me rejection letters from places saying, essentially, we can't use this. It's more like a game than a book. Not really a book. We can't publish this. Anyway, so that's one of the advantages, really, of talking. How's he doing? Oh, he's up to 59 stars. Kick ass. There's 120 stars, by the way. And... Uh, I never get tired of this. I, I love speed demos because, I mean, especially if you know the game, and I remember playing some of these where I'm like, I'm trying to carefully make my way around an area, and you'll watch this asshole just jump into the ether, hit the exact thing, and fall down. Nothing. And it's like, how many times did you play the goddamn game to get that way? Right here. See that? That's illegal. You can't do that. Nobody, you're supposed to go through this whole process to get up to that level. Not that guy. He knows if you jump, do a flip, and kick. It fucks with the engine enough that at the top of the hit, if you kick, you actually increase by 5% how high you jump. And this breaks all the level design. And this is the kind of crap that I think a lot of game designers could really enjoy using. Because it's kind of a case of where, you know, even though it breaks it, it's kind of fun that it can break it. And that becomes part of the exploration of the game, is the fact that you can kind of screw with it enough that you can do that problem comes when it's a multiplayer game and one guy knows this technique and the others don't. And that's what rocket jumping did to Quake. Once it was discovered that, wow, rocket jumping can cause me to jump higher than I ever did. All the levels break and get to everything. All right, so uh, is there anything else we wanted to talk about here? Because, you know, I'm just fucking fascinating. <laughs> I'm like a TV show that never ends, yes? Yes. That's, that's from... Um, um, Folklore.org? Okay, wait, which one? There's two. There's a scrapbook of thoughts given by people who interacted with Apple. And then there's one which I don't know as well, which is kind of a biography of Silicon Valley. Is that what that one is? Don't know it as well. I, I simply don't. I don't want to pretend I do. There are enough stories. Um, the problem with a lot of those stories, for me personally, is that they're usually written within the, within the context of sales. In other words, it's as if salesmen wrote them. So they tend to consider success and failure based on how many you sold as opposed to the pure discovery. So if you have four guys and they all came up with the ideas, but this guy came up with an idea that probably won't be popular for another 30 years, but these two made millions, the story will always focus on the two that made millions instead of the historian realizing maybe you want to get the other guy who's going to die because in 30 years they're going to realize he already came up with it. They discovered that there was a um, computer created by a German guy in the late 30s that is the first computer, like the first electromechanical or whatever computer of its type, like the first, like it's basically the computer, right? But he created it in his apartment in Germany during World War II, and nobody wanted it. And so 50 years later, this was discovered, and like, oh shit, he invented everything. And so he got kind of a retroactive Hall of Fame, whatever kind of a thing. His family got it, you know. And it's a case of like, wow, dude, and you know, there's that great kid in Alaska or Seattle who created that breeder reactor in his house. I love that kid. And when you, you know, one of my favorite quotes from him, he was like, you know, I think I've actually taken 10 years off my life, but that's well, not bad. You know, I can live with that. You know, just because he's slowly importing as much radioactive material as he can to build his breeder reactor. Like, you go, kid. Totally cognizant that he's fucked himself up in the name of doing something neat. I can appreciate that from a distance. <laughs> um, anything else? Yes, sir. According to you, who wrote the first program? A 
according to me, who wrote the first program? For hardcore electromechanical, I want to say the player piano guys of the late 1800s. Oh, yeah. No. Just to be an asshole. You asked me what my opinion was, yeah. and yes. There, see, that's what I call the game of firsts. If you look at anything, right, you can find a thing that is sort of like it before it and go, well, it was the first, but what about this? We had fun with this with text. Who are the first text artists? And we're finding cuneiform that's written in the shape of birds where it's like, oh, okay, well, you're the first, you know. But the thing is, to me, using the better question is, why do you think that, teacher? You go, well, so why do you think that wrong thing? Because then you can piece holes in his critical thinking instead of his trivia knowledge. Anyway, so um, with the reason I choose player piano people is because they had, they had several things going on. They had an audience, which meant that the, the efforts of their work was immediately uh, put out for sale, right, such that they could, less important to me that it was for sale than it meant that other people working in the same industry had to respond to it, the response the, of your programmatic work was instantaneous. That is to say, you, you ran your stuff through the player piano, you could do your compile, and you could see what the response was. So techniques rose up that before were theoretical. That's why. But there are programmatic-like things going back well before Lovelace, well before that, where you would have notches put into um, irrigation systems so that they would flow different ways on different times, right? if you want to play that game. So someone had to sit there and program the irrigation system so that it would go in different places when they switched the switch and do this and make sure that all the water ran in a certain place. But that dude, he drank very little soda. And he had no startup. Um, but his audience was different, right? They, could, they didn't have an automatic... You didn't have somebody who was going around issuing his irrigation skills. Most of them were organic and usually created within each particular community with only a little bit of cross... Pollination. Oh no, without any doubt, the game of firsts drives me nuts. It's actually what the first 20, the first 25 minutes of the first episode on here is basically, yeah, 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 there was other shit, shut up. Because there are bulletin board system-like things that exist before the bulletin board system. And Ward Christensen is quite happy, the creator of the BBS, to say this. He's like, I took a modem and put it on a phone line and had it get picked up by a computer. But that's all I did. I didn't come up with any of those, right? I just put all these functional things together. But there were, there was Community Memory, which was a four-terminal BBS that existed in the Berkeley area that all hooked up to a central computer. There were four terminals. One was in a laundromat. One was in a record company, record, uh, sorry, record store. One was in a library. And one was actually at the offices. And people were writing messages. And there was an asshole. And there were for sale messages. And there were everything else, right? This is 1972 all created by a guy whose name I'm now forgetting. He did other great work. Community Memory was another company that was a, was a group whose job was basically, we want to bring all this amazing technology to the people. Very good Berkeley approach. Um, that's, that's circa 72. Well, before that, there's Plato, which comes out in 1960, which was a network system that was being used by college students that enabled them to have lots of, uh, they had a board on it that was meant to be used for administrative announcements and quickly turned into a bulletin board where people could leave messages for each other. And there was a game on it called Oubilette, which was basically a uh, first-person shooter where one of the people who played it was a guy named Silas Warner um, who goes off and creates Castle Wolfenstein, which is where they get the idea to do return to Castle Wolfenstein or Castle Wolfenstein by the Doom guys who then go on to create Doom. So, great. And there was the system for leaving messages, which was called Plato Notes. And one of the people who worked on it was Ray Ozzy, who goes on to create Lotus Notes. Right? You can go play the, and that's why I mean, this is the kind of fun game you can play going back with this stuff. So before Plato, there's a whole bunch of people who are creating um, messages using remote teletype or using um, ham radio. Um, certainly with telegraph, you had the ability of relay stations, where basically when a message came in, a machine caught it and then would send out the message to four other locations at the same time, taking the dots and turning them out this way and also printing something locally. So there was a way to do an entire network this way. So 
those guys had lots of out of band messages they sent each other greetings news of birthdays and people would get the message and leave it stored until the time came that they wanted to push it out at the end of the day to the next group of people right that's a bulletin board system it's slow not great bandwidth and your packets could get a cold but there's a great argument there that's a bulletin board system you can do that and, and that's the great thing about history you can be an asshole all the way back to the beginning of time um, that's why I always like, so so it's good that you ask in your opinion because that's why I'm like player pianos let's just stop there right that's pretty good P player piano shit is really good because after player pianos they move to um, these uh, merry-go-rounds that have programmatic tapes in them to run an entire instrument set so there's one line for cymbals there's one line for um, uh, cymbals one for like you know a violin one for a trumpet and so on all the way through so these guys are the first mod trackers because they have to work that way and in fact Joplin Scott Joplin had to make his extra money that way he made extra money doing mod tracking on the side he was young and he needed the money. Um, I found out Joplin wrote an opera. I listened to some of it. It's something. It's like a big, huge, rag opera. Anyway. Um, I've beaten that one into the ground. Any others? Yes? You mentioned rocket jumping in Quake at some of the games. I'm sure they didn't think of it. But I'm sure their immediate response was... No, the concept behind rocket jumping is you fuck with the physics engine enough to cause your character to go someplace it can't. The idea being that as you run, you have to... Because of the way the physics engine works is that you jump and you fire a rocket and the explosion sends you your jump even higher. That requires some modification of your client. You have to put a hotkey in to be able to make your character jump, look down, fire, look back again. So the designers unintentionally put this in because they allow macros to exist, but they didn't expect that a combination of the macros. A good example in this fucking game, and it, it was almost like, like 1996, remember this thing comes out. There was a trick in the castle. Do, does everyone know this game? Okay. So in the game, there's a, there's a staircase, okay? And as you can see, like that, you can just saw him run up the side, right? Again, he'll do it here. Bang, up, over, and he'll do it again, flip himself over. Anyway, on the stairs, it's possible to get stuck on the stairs. That is to say, you jump up and you hit the stairs. And if you hit the jump hard enough, he gets stuck in the stairs. And he gets stuck in the stairs enough that he gets shot backwards, jumping the stairs. So you see him go, jump, jump, like literally... Like a, like a vibration. like Well, at the end of this game, there was an unclimbable staircase where if you run up, it keeps creating the staircase and you give up and you have to go back down again until you get enough stars. But these guys, they turn around and by hitting this thing, they climb the unclimbable staircase and can complete this game in 16 stars by the fact that there's another bug where if you grab a bunny that pops around, walk up to a door and keep grabbing the bunny, you will fall through the door because the programming is checking on the bunny more than the door. And you will be on the other side of the door that you're only supposed to get at 60 stars. So you turn around and keep going, leaving the bunny behind. Poor used bunny. So by doing that and combining it with this other trick, you can actually beat this game in 16. There's no way these guys knew that was going to happen. Like they put in a wide variety of really good programming, but they can't expect that. And I have the full expectation that the quake jumping uh, the, the rocket jumping in Quake was not a design. It was a design flaw that could then be used, utilized to have an even better game. So. I might be thinking there's a part where I think there's a small wall that you have to and the whole. There might be the case that they have some trickery in there, right? Yeah. But the thing is, there's a difference between commit this act to beat the game, in other words, complete this puzzle thinking outside of the box, to do that all the time until you win. Right, to do this until you can get to places you weren't supposed to. There's a beautiful speed run called Quake Done Quick with a Vengeance. It's a sequel to Quake Done Quick. Quake Done Quick, really quick. Quake Done Quick with a Vengeance has cases where they beat levels in six seconds. 
And the way they do it is because the programmers were all clever and they would have you come out and look up and, oh, there's the eggs that I need to get to and I have to do all sorts of stuff. But if you explode yourself up high enough, you just blow yourself backwards into the exit in six seconds. So it's a wondrous thing to watch. It's very fast. In 20 minutes, they solve Quake. Um, and it's a, ca it's a pure case of outside programming. One of the big tragedies that can happen sometimes is people get kind of hung up being given the environment they're handled. And by that, I mean that like, we're seeing this more and more, especially now with things like the PS3 and the Xbox, which are great experiments in central control of programming ability, so that there are things where they'll fill up a chip full of goo to stop you from touching the chip, and they will have the chip constantly checking itself with another chip to try to stop you from fucking with the chip. And so people screw with that, and that's fine, but ultimately what they're doing is they're playing the rules of the game by Microsoft standards. In other words, saying, I'm going to make this chip do this thing, but it's like, why do I even need to be touching that chip? Why am I using this set of chips? Why aren't I using another set of chips? In other words, like, there's great accomplishments that's done, but it's all done like, I made this blender run faster, as opposed to I built a blender. And you're going to find more and more kids are not building blenders, and more and more kids aren't realizing why we ever built blenders in the first place, because now we have meta blenders. Um, and so... It, when I see things like that, it's like these kids are really brilliant, so they made this game run faster. Ultimately, they were able to do that. And I guess part of that, it's not, it's, it, and it's not laziness. It's not lack of skills. It's just not being directed that it's out there. You know, it's like you've hacked chicken cutlets. You ever kill a chicken? A lot of kids are hacking chicken cutlets. A lot of kids haven't hacked the chicken. Anyway, so that's my pontificating. Hello, Rick. Good to have you here. Oh, it's good to have you here. I heard that hacker cons are full of just fat assholes with goatees just going off whatever shit they want to talk about for two hours. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's like getting a shot, except you don't get better afterwards. It's not even for your health. Anybody else have any other uh, subjects of me? Or crap? No? Ah, I've killed you all. Uh, thank you very much for all your time here. And uh, if there's anything else you want to talk about, I'll be at the con all weekend. I don't have any other pressing appointments unless somebody drops out again and they put me up here. Actually, I think Decius wants the next one. So, all right. Well, thank you very much.